presented by Lovecraft Country. Welcome back to Next Gen Console Watch 2020, our show following all the news and rumors on the PlayStation 5 and Xbox Series X. I'm Damon Hatfield, and as always, I'm joined by Ryan McCaffrey, host of IGN's Xbox podcast, Podcast Unlocked. Howdy, Damon. Howdy. And Jonathan Dornbush, he hosts IGN's PlayStation podcast, Podcast Beyond. Hey there. And we begin this week with the shocking news that Halo Infinite has been delayed into 2021. Uh, Ryan, this was supposed to be the big killer app for the Xbox Series X at launch. It was a much bigger exclusive than anything Sony has announced so far. How do you think this is going to affect the launch of the next Xbox console? Well, I mean, it's, it's, there's really no good way to spin it. I mean, it's not good. It's, it's definitely not good. That said, uh, I mean, it's, it's obviously best for the long-term health of this Halo game and the Halo franchise as a whole because this is the reboot for Halo, the spiritual reboot, new art direction, kind of new, new focus, open world. So, you know, they have to get this right. So I, on that sense, I completely understand and actually applaud the delay. I mean, you know, not to, not to make too crazy a deal out of it, but I do think this took some courage on the part of Phil Spencer, Bonnie Ross, Matt Booty, the Xbox leadership to, to pull your, your, killer game at the 11th hour like this three months mm-hmm. to go i mean that is that is not a decision that that had to have come easily and i'm not sure that a lot of people in their position would make that a lot of a lot of people might just forge ahead and say crunch on that game 343 and just get it out no matter what it takes but that said this definitely weakens the argument for buying an xbox series x at least at launch mm-hmm. i mean the 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 biggest exclusive at this point uh, for launch is arguably Game Pass, not a game. Yep. It's it's Game Pass itself, which granted we saw the Game Pass narrative really start to take hold by design in the Xbox Game Showcase. And Game Pass is a great thing. I'm not trying to spin this as like, oh, Game Pass is this, is that's all you get? No, Game Pass is fantastic, but that is really kind of the main appeal for jumping in uh, right on day one here in November, Microsoft did confirm as part of the Halo delay that they narrowed in their window. It will be November at some point. So, yeah, it's it's bad for the Series X in the short term, but it's good for Halo in the long term. Yeah, it's, it is interesting to think of whether or not uh, Game Pass can act as the killer app for the Xbox Series X. Uh, Jonathan, what was your uh, response when you heard about the Halo Infinite delay? And is this is this actually a win for Sony? To echo Ryan's point, as a Halo fan, I do think this is the best case scenario for Halo as a franchise. You know, they do need to get this one right. And as much as I was looking forward to playing it this fall, I, if this is supposed to be Halo for the next decade, I want to make sure it's fun for the next decade from the jump. So I think that makes a lot of sense. But when it comes to the launch, I think the PS5 has the clear edge at launch when you're looking at making a wide appeal bargain. Yes, Microsoft has Game Pass, but at least if you're an existing Xbox owner or you, uh, you're you involved in the Xbox community via PC, you already are a subscriber to Game Pass. So there's not a need to go buy Xbox Series X on day one. If you're a PlayStation fan, you have to buy a PS5 on day one to play Spider-Man Miles Morales. And I like, yes, there's been some scuttlebutt about what Spider-Man is size-wise compared to the original game, but when you when you pull back from that argument that happened online versus people looking on Amazon or looking on Target.com to go buy a, a PS5, they're going to see the new Spider-Man game, I can only buy it there. That's going to be something worth buying to them in, in, with Spider-Man there. So I do think, you know, without as recognizable a name on the Xbox side. Halo is such a big name. Without that there on day one, it is, I definitely think, going to impact the launch window of it all. But I don't think this is, you know, this seals the the case that you should never buy a Series X. I don't think it, it says that at all. The main reason given for the delay of Halo Infinite was uh, the ongoing pandemic, uh, current working conditions, just making it uh, impossible to sort of, you know, land the game on time for the the, the launch of the console. But of course, the gameplay reveal for Halo Infinite uh, really received mixed uh, mixed responses from the audience. Do you think the delay has anything to do with that? Maybe, maybe was Xbox sort of expecting a uh, a cheerier response to that gameplay reveal? Well, I I do think it quite probably had something to do with it. Now, I mean, you know, games are such long term projects. I mean, this game's been in the works for, or at least it's been five years since Halo Five. 
So yeah, I mean, the, the, the response didn't help. I mean, if uh, the fact that it was so uh, largely regarded in a, in a negative light, particularly from the technological side, I mean, yeah. it would have been one thing if, I mean, of course, gameplay is king, but if people had thought, well, boy, the gameplay stinks, well, that might've even been an even bigger problem. But on the tech side, I mean, this, the, the fact that, Halo Infinite wasn't going to have ray tracing, probably the most visually recognizable and obvious new toy that these two next-gen consoles are each packing. Halo wasn't going to have that at launch. And that just seems that it always it struck me as odd from the moment that I, I found that out in an interview with 343. And so, you know, and then came to find out that I mean there were a lot of people taking issue with just a lot of the visuals of Infinite. So you know, now, uh, I mean, they were clearly trying to make whatever decisions they needed to make to get the game out alongside the console, which obviously had included bringing ray tracing on later. So mm -hmm. now they'll get a chance to really polish it up. Because at this point, Damon, I, I would argue that it doesn't really make a difference what, when it comes out now, since it didn't hit day one. I mean, mm -hmm. March, okay. May, sure, why not? August, September, cool. What about the 20th anniversary of Halo, which is November 15th of tw 2021? Why not? I mean, the, the pressure is off. So at least now, I mean, as long as Microsoft is willing to put a lot more money into Halo, because development on with a team of that size is not cheap, as long as Microsoft's willing to continue investing in it to make it the best Halo it can be for, as Jonathan said, the next 10 years of Halo as with Infinite as a platform in, in and of itself, then yeah, I think uh, they're going to take all the time they need. Re you know, relatively speaking, I don't think it's mm -hmm. going to move out of 2021. But they've got some time, and they'll be able to get ray tracing in there, really tighten up the the sort of next gen visual impact of it on the Series X, and just button that game up. and And hopefully, we're going to get an amazing Halo out of it. Because you know what, I've waited five years as a Halo fan. I can wait three more months, six more months, even one more year. Why not? Mm -hmm. It's fine. There'll be plenty of other games to play in the meantime. Well, with Halo off the table, which next-gen consoles launch lineup that we know about as of today is looking more attractive? Jonathan, you mentioned Spider-Man Miles Morales. Is that now the biggest launch game between both the PS5 and Xbox Series X? Yeah, I think absolutely. You know, um, conversations of it being sort of a, an expansion of the original game aside, Spider-Man is such a big name. He's the most beloved Marvel character uh, based on a poll this year uh, for North America. And then just also the last few years, you know, we see how big him entering the MCU and then also maybe leaving it for a couple of weeks before coming back in, how big of a deal that was. Spider-Man is such a huge name that I think that's going to go a long way in appealing to not just like the hardcore PlayStation base that's interested in the PS5, but also the wider demographic who may be interested in a new console this fall. But I also think there's a, a unique e eclectic group of maybe smaller games that are hitting around the, the launch of the PS5 that have me personally interested, you know, from the PS4 launch Rezo Gun, I think was arguably the best game from the PS4's launch and uh, definitely the best exclusive. And it was a really unexpected small game. Uh, and I think we could see a potential in a few games like that at, at the launch of the PS5. Ryan, how are you feeling about the, uh, the exclusive launch lineup on Xbox Series X? You've got a Yakuza game in there. You'll have the console exclusive for Gears Tactics. Yep. Um, how, how do you think it's shaping up so far? I mean, it's it's actually kind of reminding me now a lot of the Xbox One launch lineup. There was a, a good variety, a good quantity of stuff, and it all had good quality, but there wasn't a, a killer app. I mean, mm -hmm. arguably, there really, there kind of wasn't on PS4's launch yeah. either. Like, mm -hmm. Killzone was good, and Rezogun, as Jonathan mentioned, I agree, was, I mean, that, as I remember, it was the highest rated game of the PS4 launch lineup on IGN. I think the only one to get a nine, but hmm. yeah, on the Xbox side, uh, it's exclusive wise, you know, the, if you're, if you're into horror games, Xbox has got you covered <laughs> between the medium and scorn. Uh, and then there's a few other smaller things. Tetris effect connected uh, is there. And that's, that's game pass. And so actually I think all three of the games I just mentioned are game pass, but there's, there's definitely a nice list, but there is not a killer exclusive or even like really kind of a list exclusive right at launch cyberpunk 2077 which of course will be on uh both platforms current and next gen that is the the probably the thing that most series x owners this holiday are going to spend the most time playing i would imagine mm -hmm. 
Well, we've talked a lot recently about how uh, both Microsoft and Sony are taking very different philosophical approaches to their next-gen consoles. Microsoft uh, wants gamers to be free to, to play their net, even their next-gen games uh, on their current Xbox One or on PC. Uh, and PlayStation 5 really wants you to leave the PS4 behind and move on to the PlayStation 5. And that philosophy seems to be extending to the hardware and the controllers like the DualShock 4. IGN's tech editor, Bo Moore, can explain. Last week, Sony revealed how current-gen controllers and peripherals will work with the PS5, while specialty peripherals like racing wheels, arcade sticks, and flight sticks, as well as headsets that connect via USB or audio jack, will all work with the PS5. Controllers are a bit more complicated. DualShock 4 controllers, as well as current-gen third-party controllers, will work with the PS5, but only while playing supported PS4 games. In other words, if you want to play PS5-specific games, you'll need Sony's new DualSense controller. Now, in a way, this is nothing new. Sony has released new controller models with each new console generation, often with new features for the next generation games to take advantage of. In this case, the new DualSense controller has haptic feedback and a built-in microphone, features that Sony says it believes that PS5 games should take advantage of. Microsoft, on the other hand, has confirmed that the Series X will be fully compatible with current-gen controllers, including official Xbox controllers, the Xbox Adaptive controller, Xbox Elite controllers, and controllers from third-party manufacturers like Scuf. Now, those last two are the real sticking point for me. The current console generation introduced the concept of Pro Controllers. These controllers come with a premium price tag, often two to three times as expensive as the base Xbox One or DualShock 4 controller, but they have extra features like back buttons, trigger stops, and swappable parts so that players can customize and, if necessary, replace their joysticks and face buttons. Essentially, they were meant to be the last controller that you would need to buy. Now, Xbox gamers will be able to bring those high-end controllers with them to the Series X, but PS5 players will be out of luck. If you invested $140 plus on a Scuf Infinity or Impact, the two controllers that Scuf makes that are compatible with the PS4, you're out of luck if you want to use that with a PS5 game like Ratchet & Clank Rift Apart or Spider-Man Miles Morales. To some degree, it's understandable. If haptic feedback and adaptive triggers are as game-changing as Sony wants us to believe, enough so that games designed with them in mind would be simply unplayable without those features, then I'm glad for it. I don't want game development to be held back by a need to support legacy hardware. But I find it hard to take Sony's word here, especially considering that this can really only apply to PS5 exclusives, as anything designed for the Xbox or PC will have to support those platforms' control options anyway. I'd much rather that Sony offer the DualSense features as an incentive for gamers to use that controller and play on the PS5, but still support current-gen hardware across the board even if it means that those players miss out on the potentially improved experience of those haptics and adaptive triggers. Instead, they're being locked out entirely. Undoubtedly, controller makers like Scuf will put out new premium PS5 compatible Pro controllers, though of course none have been officially announced just yet. But that means another $140 plus purchase for gamers who don't want to give up their back buttons. Back to you, Damon. Jonathan, what do you think about the, this idea that, that Sony seems to want you to just completely leave the PlayStation 4 behind and embrace your new your new console overlord, the PlayStation 5? <laughs> I mean, you know, it, it's one of those, it's a double-edged sword, I think, because on one hand, I'm very excited by the potential of what the DualSense might be able to pull off with the haptic feedback and all of the other sort of bells and whistles it has. But if they were to say, hey, you don't actually need it to play PS5 games, then what incentive would there be, one, for players to adopt it and for devs, most importantly, to adopt it? So I, I understand wanting to make the new hardware and the new tech that they're integrating be something you need when it comes to the PS5 experience. Uh, and, you know, the console jump in the past, especially when it comes to PlayStation, I've been used to having to buy new controllers and new hardware on the whole. So... For me, it's, it, it doesn't feel like that big of a leap. But that said, going into this generation, there is a big difference. You know, people are more used to being able to take what they have from past experiences to the next piece of hardware or just, you know, having their library and their hardware go with them as they go on. So so I get the the want to have the DualShock 4 still be compatible. And it, and it will be with PS4 games. But, mm -hmm. uh, y you know, it's, it's one thing where I, I see both sides of it and I, I get both the monetary and the technical reasoning for it. But it you know, for consumers, especially in a financially tough time, it is hard to say, hey, all that stuff you've invested possibly hundreds of dollars in will only work so far when it comes to mm -hmm. next gen. It's definitely a tough pill to swallow. Ryan, what's your take on all this? Jonathan, don't both sides this one, my friend. <laughs> this is not great. I mean, especially, uh, I we don't know yet, but I have a hunch that the DualSense 
and and we'll see about the Xbox Series X controller. But I wouldn't be surprised if the DualSense is seventy dollars. We're paying sixty dollars for controllers now, and the the DualSense has some new new gizmos in it. So you know, it's a it's a expensive pill to swallow if indeed uh, you know that if you want a more than you want more than one controller. And I point to uh, Albert Panello, who's a former executive at Microsoft. He actually ran. He managed the uh, the Xbox One X hardware platform. That was his baby. He took to Twitter about this and said, I'll just read you a little bit because it's a big, long Twitter thread. He says, there is literally no reason the DualShock 4 would not work for all PS5 games. Haptics is not the reason. The vast majority of games developed for PS5 will be taking DS4 into consideration because, as Jonathan pointed out, third parties will be shipping PS4 versions of games this holiday. And if any of those games have PC versions, they have to consider last-gen haptics as mm -hmm. well. So he goes on to point out some other things. But but yeah, I mean, the other part of this that doesn't sit well with me, and, and maybe Sony's decision will actually prove to be the exact counter to what I'm about to say, but that's uh, these, I, I don't want to call them gimmicky because that comes with some negative baggage attached to it, but the new things that the dual the dual sense is is uh, doing are things where in the past the, the track record for these thing kinds of things is not good. Uh, HD Rumble in in the Nintendo Switch, you don't really even Nintendo themselves doesn't utilize it very much. Mm -hmm. They in fact bailed on it for the for the Switch Lite, so it's not even a part of that. And then uh, on the Xbox One. The haptic triggers, the uh, or the the triggers with the sort of individual uh, motors in the in there. It's really if you play Forza, any of the Forza games, they're amazing. You can feel the brake grab, you can feel the different like the cool vibration effects. But outside of that, almost no uh, developers, first party or third party, make use of it. So history suggests that the Dual Senses features are not going to be particularly well utilized, uh, particularly as the generation goes on. So uh, I hope I'm wrong about that, but I also am definitely in the camp of being disappointed that, that mm -hmm. Sony is, is not fully supporting the DualShock 4. I, I think we're going to see a lot of use of it at launch for sure, but I totally agree with you. It's going to need to be used uh, in perpetuity for the rest of the generation for it really to be worthwhile. I, I will say I wouldn't be shocked if it doesn't end up getting used that we see the introduction of a DualShock 5, you know, that happened with the PS3 when they really mm. tried to push the six axis and the right. motion control of that mm -hmm. all. And then they were like, oh, wait, people didn't want to really use this or uh, develop for it. So we're going back to the DualShock and they they changed things. So I, I do think I, I like seeing innovation because as much as I love this generation's controllers, I don't necessarily think we can't see more innovation when it comes to controllers. Like I don't think controller technology has reached its peak forever. Um, but I do think, you know, if the specific stuff they're trying to put in there, which most likely is going to ra raise the cost of controllers, if people don't love it and if devs aren't using it, I do think we'll see them adjust to that accordingly. All good points. Okay, last week we were talking about how uh, Spider-Man will be a... Uh, exclusive to the PlayStation versions of Marvel's Avengers. We ran a poll on IGN asking you, what do you think about console exclusives? Uh, are you in favor of more in-game platform exclusives? And the winning result with over 53% uh, was no, exclusives are not great for gaming. So Jonathan, it seems uh, most of our audience lines up with the, the views of, of the op-ed that you published last week. Yeah, which, you know, makes total sense, especially I think uh, as we see from the IGN audience in particular, like these, these are, it's definitely a lot of people are very dedicated to gaming. And so you, you want to make sure that everyone kind of has a fair advantage because cross play and cross progression and all that stuff has become so much more prevalent in the way people play these days. Um, ultimately the, the market at large is going to decide if we see practices like this continue. And, you know, given that it's happened for a few generations, I think we'll definitely see it at the start of this gen for sure. Uh, whether that's, you know, PlayStation going all in, and getting even more platform exclusives in this way, I wouldn't be shocked if we see more of that for sure. But uh, ultimately, how people spend their money is going to determine whether this continues long term. All right, real quick before we go this week, we have a new poll for you to vote on for next week. Uh, does Halo's delay change your next-gen console purchasing plans? Does it change your plans for getting an Xbox Series X? Uh, are you still all in? Are you waiting until Halo is out? Or were you going to skip Xbox Series X entirely anyway? Make sure to vote at IGN.com, and we will share the results with you next week. That will do it for this edition of Next Gen Console Watch 2020. Thank you to Ryan, Jonathan, and Bo. 
We will be back next Friday at 6 a.m. Pacific, 9 a.m. Eastern with more news and rumors on PS5 and Xbox Series X. We'll see you then.